Amazing Grace, the favorite hymn of Dr. H. Orton Wiley, renowned educator and theologian of the Church of the Nazarene. Here is Dr. Wiley in his study, visiting with Dr. Paul T. Culbertson. Uh, Dr. Wiley, um, where were you born? I was born in Marquette, Nebraska, about halfway between Central City and Aurora. And that was in uh, what year? 1877, November the 15th. I think I remember hearing you um, or reading uh, some comments uh, made by you in one of your sermons in your book, God uh, Has the Answer about the fact that you were um, reared, I believe, in a sod house. Is that uh, true? Yes, I was born in a sod house and uh, lived in a sod house till I was between four and five years old. How old were you when you, your family, or when you came to uh, the far west, to California? I was eight years old, and uh, I was nine, I think, just a little later. We came in the spring. You located where in California? Tulare. Tulare County up in the San Joaquin Tulare Valley. Tulare City, Tulare County. I remember that you uh, lived for a time in, in Oregon. When did you go to Oregon? We went to Oregon in 1893. You attended school there, didn't yes, you? Yes, I attended the uh, Medford High School. Went in 93, 94, and then graduated in 95. And then... Uh, attended the Southern Oregon, what is now the Southern Oregon School of Education. Yes, it was the Southern Oregon Normal then. I graduated there in 1898. Wasn't it during this time that you uh, worked as a druggist? Yes, I worked in Strang's Drugstore uh, while I was in the high school. You were actually a licensed pharmacist during those years. Well, I uh, was studying for, for the certificate, so I had an assistant pharmacist certificate, took my examination in Portland. Then the next year, I was granted a full certificate. When did you return to California? I came back in uh, 1901. Came down in Christmas 1900, and I started into university in 1901, the second semester. That was in Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California. You, you, were, uh, you were converted when you were in Oregon, were yes, you Yes, Medford, Oregon. And when did you uh, first uh, really feel a call to the ministry? Well, while I was working in the drugstore, it kept growing on me all the time, so I dropped out of the drugstore and came down and started in the university. Did you come from a family of ministers? Uh, had there been prominent ministers in your family? My grandfather was United Brethren minister. And his name was? Ward. J.W. Ward. J.W. Ward. Well, that's uh, very interesting. And you attended the university then... And were you preparing for the ministry, yes. uh, basically? When did you serve your first pastorate uh, in the church, or in, in, the, in the United Brethren Church at first, was yes. it not? Yes, I, I, my first pastorate was at Gridley. I had uh, three appointments, Gridley, Live Oak, and Bangor up back in the hills. Uh, do you remember anything particular that happened uh, during those uh, earliest pastorates that is, uh, is of interest to us? I remember my first sermon. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, I had never preached. I'd been president of the Young People's Society in the United Brethren Church. But I'd never preached. But uh, I had the idea, I got I suppose, from the homeless people about it didn't need much preparation. But I was a little uh, worried about that. And so I had two sermons prepared. Um... Uh, they didn't expect a preacher and wasn't looking for one. They had rented the parsonage and it seemed to me as if it was a rather cool reception. But I took hold of the service and I preached in the morning, used all my sermon material up, looked at my watch, I'd talk just five minutes. The next thing I did was to swing over gracefully or otherwise <laughs> to my evening sermon, took my text and preached all of that and looked at my watch. And I'd preach just ten minutes, or just five minutes more, ten minutes altogether. It seems to me like I've read somewhere, I've forgotten, about Dr. Brzee's first sermon. It seems to me like he had a similar experience. Yes. 
He preached all the way from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> Now, when did you actually become actively associated with the Nazarenes? When well, I, was, I became associated with them while I was in, um, in uh, the university, and I attended the Oakland Church there. Yes. And my father had a grocery store, and I did a lot of the delivering, drove, drove a delivery wagon all over there. And we had a family by the name of House that, uh, that uh, dealt with us in the store. And they were trying to build up a Sunday school, and a young lady asked my father if they had any young people in the family. He said yes, he had a young man, a young woman. So she asked me to have them come out to Sunday school. <laughs> so they laughed at me about it, but I went out to Sunday school. It happened to be uh, Alice House. And she subsequently became Mrs. Yes. Wiley. But then I, uh, we went into the ministry, the United Brethren Ministry, after that, because yes. there wasn't any churches then, you know, in the Church of the Nazarene. Now, when did you join the Church of the Nazarene, and when were you ordained? Were you ordained by Dr. Brzee? Yeah. When was that? Well, in 1906. I supplied the church there in, in, uh, in uh, 1905, and... Uh, then I was called to the assistantship of Dr. Bell in the United Brethren Church. And so Brother Chafee decided finally not to come. So after I'd moved down to uh, Oakland, stayed one Sunday, I moved back. They called me back. To, I get to charge of the church there. In Berkeley. In Berkeley. And that was... Associate the, pastor with Dr. With Brother Gerwin. You spent just one day as associate, or one oh, Sunday, with one the associate Sunday. pastor in the United <laughs> Brethren Church at Oakland. Yeah. Well, that was a rather short ministry. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, tell me a little bit about your um, further education and preparation for joining the um, forces here in connection with Pasadena University, or Nazarene University, as it was called. Well, I was on the Esparta circuit. They changed dis uh, district superintendents, or presiding elders, they called them then. Yes. And this new presiding elder was there, uh, talked with me and told me at that time that the best thing for me to do would be, if I could at all do it, was to go to a seminary. Yes. And so I made arrangements to go down to Berkeley Seminary. It was the Berkeley Theological Seminary then, the Pacific Theological Seminary. So I came, I, I came down, moved down, and then traveled back and forth to, to Esparto every week and started on the seminary in 1905. Now, um, you came then to um, the South in 1910, was it? Yes. At that camp meeting, Dr. Brzee was there and Fred Everson and so on. And I had just graduated in the seminary and so on, and so the... Uh, they wanted me to come down. And that was the old Beulah Park camp. That's the old Beulah Park, yes, yes. over in East Oakland. And then I came down, and Miss Cora Snyder and I made the first catalog. And then I went back and moved down on the first day of August. That was the year in which uh, the um, uh, Nazarene University was moved from Hollywood to uh, the Pasadena campus? And moved from the 28th Street by Oh, I see. Uh, Yes, the 28th Street. The Hollywood uh, campus was sold for this property, the Hubert's Ranch. Yes. Now, Dr. Brzee was um, then considered president of Nazarene University, was he not? He was president of the university and president of the board of trustees. Yes. And uh, they talked it over and, and uh, wanted me to organize the College of Liberal Arts and made me dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Davenport's College of the... Uh, of the East Pacific Bible College, and of course, Snyder had the academy. Yes. The three of us, and then they made me vice president to have charge. Now, uh, Dr. Brzee retired from the presidency in what year? That... Well, uh, they elected Dr. Ellison in 1911. I was here in 10 and 11, and then they elected Dr. Ellison in 11, and Dr. Brzee resigned, and they had to quite a inauguration service for Dr. Ellison on the front porch of what's now the West Dorm. Now, you were elected president to succeed Dr. Ellison in what year? Thirteen. 1913. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you told me one day about uh, the fact that uh, Dr. Ellison had been elected president, I believe, of another college, Olivet. hadn't he? Olivet. Olivet Nazarene College, mm -hmm. and that uh, the two of you in adjacent rooms 
worked out the catalogs for these two institutions. Uh, he worked out the catalog for all of it, and I worked out the one for Pasadena just through the door there. Well, no, no doubt these two catalogs were somewhat alike. No. They weren't? We never saw one, either one. Oh, is that so? I never showed them mine. <laughs> <laughs> they never showed me theirs. <laughs> Dr. Allison was here then for a period of what, about two, two years. About two years, mm -hmm. I see. And so what he came, there several came from uh, uh, the Open Isle, and so we had our first class that graduated in uh, in, the, in 12, and then he graduated the next class in 13. Yes. Now, now your first presidency was... Um, from 1913 to 1916, was it? Yes, 1916. And then you returned to uh, Berkeley Went to, to Berkeley continue. Berkeley as pastor, and while there they called me up to the Idaho Owner School, it was then. I see. What? And it is now? Northwest Nazarene College. Yes. You were there for how long? Ten years. What, uh, what kind of a period was that in your life? It was certainly strenuous. We had... Uh, had no uh, equipment much, and and the location didn't seem to be just right in the eyes of the Northwest District. There's only one district then, the great Northwest District, and uh, it was rather hard going, financially and otherwise. But we lived through it, had lots of got lots of experience. <laughs> the hard way. Yeah. Well, what about that incident about the coal? I remember hearing oh. you tell about that. Uh, well, I came down across the corner of the campus one day, and the uh, clouds were up in the west, and I knew we were going to have a snowstorm, and I knew we only had a half a ton of coal in the in the bunkers, and that it took a ton of day to keep us going. Sometimes, you know, we had to take all those pipes out and thaw them out in the heating plant and yes. put them back. And I had my head down, and I was saying to myself, I wonder why it is that Holding the schools are sending out missionaries and preachers and, and so on, yet they're always on the ragged edges of things financially. And I just couldn't understand it. And the Lord seemed to whisper to me and say that the trial of your faith, being more precious than gold, though it be tried with fire. I got my head up and went into the office, cold, we didn't have any heat much. And the telephone bell rang, and they said, uh, did you order a, a carload of coal? And I said, no, we didn't. And he said, somebody did, and we can't find out who did it. He said, would you like to have it? I said, well, I'd like to, but we don't have any money. Oh, he said, your credit's good. I said, send it out. And the roads were so muddy in those days, they didn't have any paving, that they sent it out in carts, two-horse carts. Yes. And uh, they came down the muddy old muddy road and drove on the north side of the campus and got up to the bunkers. And I sat there and listened to that coal rolling in the bunkers. And I think it's one of the greatest blessings I ever had hearing, those, hearing that coal going to those bunkers that day. Well, I'm sure it must have been a wonderful experience, though a difficult one. Yeah. Now, you were 10 years at Nampa, and then you returned to Pasadena, yes. as I recall. What year was that? I came back in, um, in 1926. I closed uh, the commencement up there, and, and I came down in. You remained how long? Here. The second time. Oh, yes. Well, I was president three years, but I went back to Kansas City, and they elected me editor in 1928. So I had to give up and went back there. This period in 1926 to 29 was a period when you were very definitely concerned with financial problems here at Pasadena, yes, as I recall. and many others. Uh, you spent then how many years as editor of the Herald of Holiness? I was actually editor for eight years, two full terms. But uh, I moved back there in 29, and uh, then I moved back here in 33. And uh, I had the Herald of Holiness for, uh, from August till January from my office up here. Well, and, in Pasadena. Uh, then I s submitted my resignation to the Board of Superintendents at the annual meeting. And uh, they accepted it, and so I was free from it then. What, uh, what impressions do you have as, uh, as you think back upon your experience as editor? Well, 
You don't know how much you're doing or what you're doing or if you're doing anything unless you make a mistake and then you find it out in a hurry. But I really enjoyed my work. Of course, I tried to make the hair a little more of a journal, a newspaper, but uh, I think Dr. White has done well in making it a newspaper. But uh, I served up till 33 and then they asked me to continue as editor and write the editorials. And they put in Dr. Shelby Corlett as office editor. Yes. Now you returned to Pasadena College for the third time as president in 1933. 33. And remained there until 1948, was it not? Yes, well, it was close of 48 and 49. I think the most uh, perhaps significant event during those years was the liquidation of the debt on the administration building and the accreditation. We wonderful. had the liquidation of the debt, though, in 1926, too, when it's turned yes. over there. That is right. There was only just a few scattering things. The debt was raised. Yes, we uh, had our accreditation. I think that Dr. Pergeiser and yourself, if I recall, went up to carry the thing through. Well, it was uh, a privilege to be associated with you in those years when we were securing accreditation. Now let's uh, think of some of the outstanding personalities with whom you've been associated over these many years, and especially in the earlier years. Um, obviously, you were very close to Dr. Uh, Phineas Franklin Brzee, the founder of the Church of the Nazarene. As I recall now, he was converted as a boy, young man in New York State, and then uh, sanctified during his uh, uh, ministry in Iowa as a pioneer Methodist preacher. Then in, I believe it was 1883, he came to Southern California. He became um, pastor of the leading Methodist church in this area, as I recall. What uh, church was that? That was the, uh, what was called the Fort Street Church then. It's what is first church now. And uh, he was asked to preach for them, and so at the next conference they elected him as pastor there. He came to Pasadena, and... Uh, they had just built a church here, but it was too small. So he uh, had a tabernacle built right alongside of it. Well, see, quite a little. I think it's between two and three thousand somewhere there. And uh, he preached in that tabernacle, and he had it full. But of course, he was always uh, for prohibition and against vice of any kind. And he preached a sermon. They called his rhinoceros sermon, you know, <coughs> and. Uh, they burned him in effigy one time on the in the park down here in Pasadena. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. I remember that sermon that uh, there was a move on to repeal uh, local option, I think, and mm. someone said that the sermon was uh, hot enough to pierce a rhinoceros's hide. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was a great believer, not only in heart holiness, but in uh, holiness applied to the social problems of, of the day. And he knew how to strike where it hurt, too. Yes. <laughs> you, you know the uh, expression, don't you, that he used? No, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, he used this expression. Anybody that would sell liquor and ruin families would sell his own daughter into prostitution. Well, that uh, must have been the that, that key sentence the, in that, that sermon. That was the key sentence in there. And they, they well, this uh, fusion of concern for holiness of heart and uh, holiness in society, if we might put it that yeah. way, the eradication of social evil and concern for the poor, these seem to me to be a, a most helpful combination of, of values and of objectives. His uh, uh, a liking for ministry to the poor people is really the source of our church in a way. You know? yes. That's the reason we call the Church of the Nazarene. I a lot see. of folks yet think... Asking whether anything good good could come out of Nazareth. I see. Well, I didn't realize that, yeah. and uh, but I see that I do see the connection. Yeah, that's that is the connection. Doctor Whitney gave it the term. The term. Yes. Now, um, as I recall, one of the reasons for the increasing opposition to Doctor Brzee in the Methodist Church was the fact that he brought uh, to this area many early holiness evangelists. Dr. Brzee was superintendent then, and he had meetings and very Oh, places. yes. And uh, uh, Brother Gay used to tell us that uh, in one church, I've forgotten which church it was now, 
that the evangelists were preaching and had been preaching wholeness and hadn't been much of a move. So that Dr. Brzee, after the preaching was through, got up on the altar and talked to him and laid it down for the straight. said, now if what these people are preaching is true, you folks need the experience. If it isn't, well, then we don't need the preachers. And when he got through with them, it just broke up everywhere, you know. Think of that. And Brother Gay said, that's where the Church of Nazarene was born. Don't you think that uh, probably there are many holiness preachers who preach holiness without much opposition and who uh, possibly need a, 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 a greater degree of positiveness and of urgency in the matter that will arouse opposition and get people sanctified? Yes. We used to have a saying that when they preached wholeness, we'd ask the question, do they preach it sincerely enough and definitely enough so they could call an altar service for it? Yes. That was well, that, that seemed to be true in Dr. Brzee's yes. ministry. Yeah, it was true. As well, I understand it. They, they were either all for him or all against him. <laughs> Well, I find that uh, frequently in the earlier messages yeah. of Dr. Brzee. Now, uh, I'm interested also in uh, some of the other characteristics of his personality. It seemed to me he was uh, an unusually uh, interesting and uh, admirable type of individual. Uh, for example, his optimism. He always said we're on the, in the morning of our existence and the sun never sets in the morning. We haven't reached our zenith. Those are great expressions of his all the time. Seemed to me like I've heard somewhere that, is it true that he always said good morning to people? Yes. He'd meet people any time of the day and night, and there's always <laughs> good morning. People look at him strangely. <laughs> then this concern that he had for the underprivileged, uh, the poor, uh, the um, people who uh, did not have all the advantages of others, this was an enduring feature of his uh, all the way through. interest, wasn't it? He wanted to preach to poor people, and he never would have any reserved seats. And he always got the people that are hard of hearing right up inside the altar. Well, and, uh, I remember one uh, in one of his messages, he said that uh, we want our churches so, uh, so plain uh, that uh, the poorest individual will feel welcome, and if he can get here on time, he'll get a front seat. <laughs> I think times have changed, haven't they, a little bit there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they used to forget the front seats. But he was, uh, he was against the expenditure of, of great funds for elaborate equipment, as yeah. I understood it, at least, in those yes, days. Yes, he was. But uh, still, he didn't want any just sheds, you know. Yes. The well, first church was a nice church. Well, that's, that's interesting. Wall Street. Yes. Another uh, feature of his ministry that... Uh, interested me was his friendliness. Uh, someone was telling me about his arrival early at church on Sunday morning to greet the people. He always stood at the door and greeted the people as they came in. He never went to the back of the church after service. Uh, what was his uh, thinking <clears throat> uh, at that particular point? Do you think? Well, he wanted to greet them, have them come in and get acquainted with them. But he used to kind of laugh and say, he said, I after I got through preaching, I didn't feel like meeting anybody. <laughs> I see. How would you characterize Dr. Brzee as a, as a leader? What are your major impressions about him? Well, he was, he was just naturally a leader. You didn't have to be with him only a few minutes to see that. Yes. But then he was quite reserved. He never pushed himself forward or anything like that. The fact is, he wouldn't preach unless they kind of begged him to. Well. And um, he was a wonderful, wonderfully efficient as a presiding officer. He knew he was a parliamentarian from the word up before it go. He's a very persistent man, as I recall, from oh, one of your yes, accounts. I was secretary with him in the Northern California. It's a San Francisco district then, as you know. And we are coming up, just finishing up. And... Uh, it came up time for noon, and uh, uh, Brother Liner, with the district superintendent, said, Now, let's don't, uh, we only just a little more to do here, and let's finish up. Then we had, we'd have the afternoon meeting in the evening. And, but they talked more, it seemed, in those days than they do now, and so they got off on various things. And, and then Brother Liner said, Well, I didn't know it was going to take so long. I think we'd better adjourn. And Dr. Brzee said, No, I wanted to adjourn a while ago, and you wouldn't let me, and I was going to stay here. So we get it through. 
So I sat on one side of the table from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon without getting up, while he sat on the opposite side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> we got through at 4 o'clock that afternoon and missed the afternoon session. I think somewhere I've read about the fact that if he were looking for a house and happened to pass it, he'd go clear around the block rather than oh, go back. That's when he's driving a horse and buggy. If he missed the number, he always say, oh, it's just in there around the block. He never liked to turn back. <laughs> I think that's quite indicative of his that, wonderful that was, that was indicative of persistence. His persistence. It was a little difficult for me to get uh, acquainted with Dr. Brzee because he was all self-effacing, you know. He'd come out and say, now, I don't know whether I ought to speak today or not. And, of course, I was always used to taking orders from a superior being, and I didn't know whether to, what to say. I didn't want to contradict him. I soon learned, though. I said, oh, no, doctor, they're expecting you here, and everything's all in order. Well, he said, all right, then. That's what they, <laughs> That's the way he always did, though. He wouldn't push himself out. They wanted him to preach. They had to make it pretty plain that they wanted him. 